it's time for the Property Podcast, where every week, tens of thousands of property investors, new and experienced, join together to get news, knowledge, and laughs at our expense. With me, Rob Bentz. And me, Rob Dix. Join us every Thursday morning for your weekly dose of property ideas and motivation. Then head over to our website at thepropertypodcast.com to keep the conversation going. Now though, let's get started. Hello everyone and welcome to the Property Podcast. It is episode 96. Thank you for joining us. I'm Rob B and with me as always is Rob D. Hey Rob, how are you today? I'm very well, thank you. A little bit anxious about this episode and with good reason because it's property predictions for 2015. If you're listening to this in January 2016, um, nothing to see here. Move on, move on, don't listen. Who knows how we've got on. But yeah, we're going to be doing predictions for 2015 in this episode. Plus resources of the week, plus news, plus all that good stuff. But Rob, it's a good thing that we didn't record this podcast a couple of days ago, because I feel like we've only just got our voices back after that epic day with the Property Hub Summit and then the Property Hub Meetup. Yeah, what a great day. Um, So for those of you who don't know, we recently had our Property Hub Summit event, which was absolutely fantastic. Just a small room with just a, a small group of focused switched on investors who want to better themselves and improve themselves and turning up on the first Sunday of the year to really make that happen for them. So pleased with how that event went. Everyone seems to be really positive, some really nice comments. And I know people have filled out their feedback forms, but also a few additional emails as well. People talking about the value they got out of it. So that was really nice. And it's going to be really exciting to find out what they've done in the three months when we follow up, when we do our follow up with them. So that was really good. And then just because we love property, Rob, that wasn't enough starting at half eight and going till five. No, no, no. At half five till half seven, we had the Property Hub meetup, which was awesome. And I'm so glad we restricted tickets. So this time it wasn't like a sauna. Yeah, it was a lot more pleasant this time around in terms of the conditions, but um, every bit as pleasant in terms of the company. So good to get out there and meet people. Thank you to everyone who came along. I just had such a good time catching up with people who we'd met before at previous events and putting faces to names from the Property Hub. It was just really great. And again, such a great atmosphere. A few people said to me how they'd never been to an event like this before and they'd come down on their own and were a bit nervous about it. But they found it really welcoming and just had a really good time just chatting property with people. So it was it was a brilliant event. We'll be doing it again in a couple of months if you didn't make it down. And I really would recommend it because unlike some other events, there's no pressure. There's no sales pitch. It's just chatting with nice people about property and you can't go wrong, really. I also find it really interesting because we get direct feedback on the podcast from people. Oh, Rob, people are still talking about Rick. I think I had two separate people say to me that they almost didn't listen to the podcast because they heard our cheesy American voiceover guy and thought it was an American podcast. So although it was a tough decision to dump Rick at the time, I'm glad we did it. We probably lost a lot of listeners that way. (laughs) Yeah, we probably would have had double the listeners. Yeah, you're right. (laughs) And we've just opened the back catalogue as well. So people are going to be going back through the first 40 episodes going, what? Yeah, if you don't know who Rick is, go back to the first sort of, I think, say 30 podcasts to be safe. And you can listen to our old intro. Yeah, so if you're a new listener, you might want to check that out. And Rob, your Property Geek Podcast, it's back. It is back, finally. Yeah, it was last March that I said, oh, I'm just going to take a break for a couple of months. Um, Ten months later, it is back. Yellow Lessings is the reason for that, among other things. Regular listeners will know that we haven't exactly been slacking for the last year, but the Property Geek podcast was a casualty of that. But it is back. The first episode went up a couple of days ago. So do get over to propertygeek.net and check it out. Or if you're a subscriber on iTunes already, you should find it's already downloaded for you. Lots of good stuff coming up on that in the next couple of months. Got some really great guests covering a whole range of topics. So do check it out. And before we get into our new story... Rob, I have to point out that you've moved location to Spain, which is absolutely fantastic. But just to make our listeners feel better, at least our UK listeners feel better, I believe you're wrapped in a blanket. Yeah, Valencia in January is a wonderful place to be. It's lovely blue skies, but it's not, it's not the warmest. It's warmer than the UK, but the houses have no central heating because it's not often. It's only about a month out of the year when it's not boiling hot. So yes, I am currently wrapped in a blanket because I've had to turn off our one heater because it's getting picked up on the microphone. So yeah, I am not feeling all that smug today. <laughs> well, let's see if we'll be feeling smug after our predictions in a year's time. But we will not know. We'll have to wait a year. We've reasonably smug after last time. We've done pretty well. 
I've done this for the last two or three years now and I've not embarrassed myself yet. So let's see if we can do that today, Rob. <laughs> but before we do, let's have a look at our new story of the week. And it's something that you've picked out. Yeah. So this story is a new entrant to the lending market. Fleet Mortgages is a new company that has just opened its doors for lending. I don't know a huge amount about what they're offering. I know that they're a specialist buy-to-let lender, and I know that they've got some special HMO products. And apparently, from what I've read, they are interested in professional investors and portfolio landlords in a way that some other lenders aren't. You'll often find this tricky situation where if you're a first-time landlord, it can be hard to get lending because you've got no experience. But if you've got too many properties or you've got too many with the same lender, they consider that too much exposure and they won't lend to you either. So Fleet apparently is going to be more friendly towards portfolio landlords. But just in general, I think it's really interesting because it means that there's um, more competition in the mortgage market, which is great for us as investors because more competition means lower rates and it means more options. And it kind of backs up what we've been saying recently, Rob, about how even though people are talking about interest rates going up, which they inevitably will do at some point, it doesn't necessarily mean that mortgage rates are going to get dramatically more expensive because we might find that while base rates are going up, competition might simultaneously drive mortgage rates down. Yeah, the, well, Rob, that's kind of leading us into what we want to discuss this week because before we go into our predictions, we're going to look at some of the macro factors that may affect or we should say will affect the property market in one way or another. So, Rob, why don't you lead us into this week's episode? Because I think it's going to be really interesting what we've got to say this week. Yeah, okay. So property predictions for 2015. You can find the show notes for this episode at thepropertyhub.net slash property predictions 2015. That's where you'll find the links that we talk about and a summary of the discussion. We're going to give our own predictions later on as we always have done. We're also going to look at what the experts have got predicted for the year ahead. But before we get into all that, yeah, let's look at what some of the big factors are. So we're going to see what the experts say. Notice that I'm not including us in the experts there. But what's everyone basing this on? It's going to be an interesting year. Lots going on, um, more going on than usual, you might say, that could affect the housing market. So Rob, let's get into that list. What's the first thing that you think could have an effect on the market this year? Yeah, let's have a look. What I would add, Rob, is I've, I've read some of these experts' views And they talk about maybe a selection of these things we're going to talk about, but don't talk about them all. And I think you have to talk about them all before you can talk about what's going to happen this coming year. And the first thing is lending isn't great. Lending, it hasn't been great for years, but it still hasn't recovered. So where people are talking about how the property market's moved on, that prop- the property market has actually moved on with a terrible lending market. You know, the buy-to-let investors I work with, we get lending, otherwise RMP property wouldn't exist. But we have to work for it. That, you know, that's, that's the truth. And you could kind of come up with the conclusion that, well, actually, if lending actually eased a little bit and became a little bit easier, then the market would push on quite significantly. Now, if that happens or not, I'm I'm not too sure. I, I believe the banks are still deleveraging and, and trying to get money into the system. And by being a little bit strict with the lending, that's one of what the ways they can do that. I think 2015 will be same as before. I, st- I don't think it's going to be the year where it all changes for lending. I believe using good brokers is absolutely paramount because if you don't, you could get yourself into a deal and find out you can't complete And I believe getting yourself prepared with all your documents ready for whatever investment you go into is going to be a good thing to do. So lending isn't great. And I believe that trend will continue. And this is not a recent thing. This has been going on for years. It's just that more people are coming into the market now and like, wow, it's this hard. But the thing is, because it's hard, it's a barrier for some people because some people give up. And when the landing eases, we will see a kick, which leads into the 18 year property cycle and all the things about predictions. So I'll come on to mention this and how it affects our predictions in a bit. But it's certainly a factor to be aware of. Yeah, so lending is always a factor, but there's a few things specifically having happening this year which could have an effect that we don't normally see, a few kind of one-off events. And one of those is the general election. Obviously not a one-off event, but they only happen every four or five years. So what effect is the election going to have? Well, post-election, we have no idea because we don't know who's going to win. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what their policies are going to be. I think we'll see a lot more policies being announced in the coming months, which are going to have housing as a component of that. Labour has already 
been kind of having some tough rhetoric on landlords and all that kind of thing because I think it could be a vote winner. I'm sure other parties are also going to make housing a kind of a, a key point of their manifestos because housing, as well as being great for investment, it is kind of a problem in this country as well. And so people are going to be talking about that. In the lead up to the election, hard to say how much of an effect it's going to have. Elections tend to kind of slow things down because there's uncertainty. And if there's one thing that any market doesn't like, it's uncertainty. So you could say that volumes and prices are going to be depressed in the lead up to the election. At the moment, it feels like um, the kind of the real kind of bump in prices and the bump in activity that we had around sort of autumn 2014 it's kind of backed off a little bit anyway. So it's not like we're kind of racing ahead and then the brakes are suddenly going to put on. It's probably just things are easing off anyway and things are going to remain that way until the election's out of the way. So that's one thing that you could argue are going to keep prices down a little bit this year. The other thing about the election is what happens after the election. So leading up to there's that uncertainty. But the election itself, if there's a hung parliament or there's a party in there to support the majority party to put them in control, such as the SNP, how will the market feel about that? You know, will they, will they feel positive or will they feel negative? Will the economy be affected because of it? And therefore, the economy therefore kicking onto property. Having a clear outright winner would be a good thing for property. And if it is a coalition, then we want two, what I would call, mainstream parties. I think the general markets would be nervous if the SNP or UKIP you know, I know a lot of people like both parties, but they are unknowns. And if they have a say in the overall policies of this country, the markets may feel nervous for a while. And that may have a, a slight kick on effect to property as well. However, if we if we get a majority winner, then the market could do very well, you know, because the certainty is there. And it's like, wow, phew, it wasn't as bad as we thought. Let's go on. So the election certainly can have an impact both positively and negatively. We'll have to wait and see. But one thing we won't have to wait and see for, and we know that's happening, is the pension reforms. And they kick in in springtime as well. In the spring, we've mentioned this before, well, I won't go into too much detail what the pension reforms are, because we've done a whole podcast on it. And we'll link to it in the show notes. So if you go to thepropertyhub.net forward slash property predictions 2015, we'll link to that pensions reform podcast. You must listen to that because it will have an effect on the property market. Essentially, what people are now allowed to do is take their pension pots when they come to retirement age, which currently is 55 or older, take it all out if they want and spend it on what they want. Previously, I know you'd think, well, if you're not at retirement age, you may think, well, surely I can do what I want with my pension pot. But no, actually, there was a lot of restrictions. So now people will be utilising their pension pots and putting it into different things of their choosing. I don't think it's a wild assumption to think, oh, okay, well, then people are going to invest in property. It certainly will happen. The percentage-wise of those people is debated, but I don't really care if it's 5% or 60% of those people who then go to invest in property. Even 5%, while it sounds like a small number, would have a massive effect on the property market. We've got two events happening quite close to, to each other, the election and the pension reforms. One offers uncertainty, but the other pension reforms certainly will add a boost to the market. I am certain of that. It's just whether we have more boosting effects than the negative effects. But the pension reforms is certainly one of the boosting effects, and it's a big boost at that. Yeah, it certainly is. And another one-off event, which in fact has already happened, but we're only going to start really seeing what the effect is in 2015, is the stamp duty changes. So the old slab system is dead. We've now got a far more sensible system without these crazy bands where things suddenly kick in and distort the market. And this is another factor which you could argue will make the market pick up or could hold it back or whatever, because we don't know what the effect of these is going to be. I personally think that the effect of stamp duty is going to be minimal in terms of property prices in general. You could certainly argue that it's going to bring prices down right at the top end, because it is those kind of like sort of million pound plus properties where stamp duty is going to be a lot higher than it was before. It's also going to sort out some of those weird distortions that you get around points where the old bands used to change. So around sort of 125,000, 250,000, where you often kind of had very strange distortions just above and below that number. That's not going to happen anymore. But I think the net effect on prices in general is going to be pretty minimal. So although stamp duty is something that's going to be in the mix this year, along with everything else, I don't see it having a big effect on prices in general, especially when you put it next to some of the other factors that we've talked about and will talk about, which seem like they're going to be far more powerful in dictating prices. 
And one of those factors is interest rates. So, Rob, are interest rates going to go up in 2015? And what impact are they going to have? I believe no. Actually, I don't think they will. I, I still think that they're going to keep it at the, the current levels. I don't think they're going to rise this year. If I will caveat, <laughs> if they do, it will be at the very, very end of the year. Um, so the last quarter. So I'm pretty confident. Now, if you're putting any financial bets on this advice, please don't. This is just my opinion. And every, I'm going to talk about a lot of things. And so we'll rob about what we think is going to happen. We're just two guys. Yes, we're in this all day, every day, and we've been reasonably correct before, you know, there or thereabouts. It doesn't mean we're going to be correct this year. So please don't take this as the gospel truth that will take place. This is just our opinions. Like other experts have, have put their opinions out there. It is an educated guess at best. That's all it is. So I will say that before I go any further. But interest rates now, I don't believe will go up this year. If they do, it'll be the very, very end of the year. So people who are looking at fixed rates or, or trackers over a two year period, if the tracker is slightly more favorable, if it was me, and again, I'm not telling you what to do, but if it was me, I'd probably be looking at a two-year tracker rather than a two-year fix because I don't think the rates have been moving up until next year at the earliest. And that's really because while the the economy is generally improving worldwide, there's instability. There are things that are not quite right. It's not as bad as it was, but there could be some events, let's say, that could happen this year. And that leads me into talking about China and to a lesser effect, a much lesser effect, not that it's a lesser country, it's a fantastic country, but economic-wise it doesn't have the same strength, China and Australia, China being a powerhouse of the two. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in my prediction, but all all I'm going to say is if their markets fall this year, both the property markets and the general economy, then that could have an impact over here in the UK. And I'll talk about that more in my prediction. But it's something to be aware of because last year I talked about in the next couple of years, I believe, China to go and Australia to follow. We're in the second year of those two years now. And I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to change it to say, oh, another two years. I believe this is the second year of those two. If you follow the 18 year property cycle that we talk about, I believe China's in the winner's curse. I'll come back to it in my prediction, but I, I do believe we could have an event there very soon. Okay. So those are some of the big factors that are going to affect prices this year. There's the lending market, there's the election, there's pension reforms, stamp duty, potential interest rate rises, and what Rob's hinted at in China and Australia. So there's some of the factors that are in the mix. Before we get into our predictions, let's see what the experts are saying. So not that you should listen too much to experts, because I don't remember any of these people predicting the crash just before it happened. But last year, most predictions were in the range of 4 to 8%. And in the end, it came in towards the top end. So according to the nationwide figures, prices rose by 7.2% in 2014. I believe the Halifax has it slightly higher, but you can say that it was around 7% last year. And for 2015, boringly enough, everyone seems to be saying pretty much the same thing. All the predictions that I've seen have been around about the 4% mark. So that includes people like um, Ray Bulger from the broker John Charcoal. It includes Henry Pryor, the BBC's commentator as well. A lot of people are saying 4%. Peter Bolton King from Ricks is saying 3%. So he's going a little bit lower. But most people are saying 4 So there seems to be a bit of a consensus You could argue that it's just people playing it a little bit safe because no one really knows what's going to happen because there is so much going on this year. That's what they're saying. I don't think we can put it off any longer, Rob. We might have to actually um, put our own bets in. And don't tell me, Rob, I have to go first, yeah? Of course you do. Yeah, I thought I might. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So let's have a look at it. What's going to have an impact? We've talked about it. Lending isn't great. The election, pension reform, stamp duty, interest rates, and a potential event in China. Lending isn't great, but that's been going on already. So I don't think that's going to have an effect either way. We just have to struggle on as we are. The election could have an effect, but that's a real unknown. So I'm going to take that out of the equation when I put my predictions together, because it could be positive, it could be negative. Pension reforms are certainly a positive, and I do believe Come springtime, pushing through to the summer, that will have a positive effect. As Rob said, stamp duty won't have that much of an effect either way. And I think interest rates staying low is a good thing for property investment. While lending isn't great, that's offset by the interest rates being low. All that being said, last year I I predicted that the London property market may not 
be the only area that looks to grow and other areas will push on. I know that seems like, well, Rob, that happened, but when I made the prediction, it hadn't. This year, I believe it'll be stronger again. So I believe your northern cities like Manchester and Leeds and then what I would call your sort of next cities down from there property-wise, your Liverpools, your Sheffields, your Nottinghams, those types of places will do well this year. London, I'm pretty sure, will only do as well as those places, if not underperform. And I'm leaning towards more underperform versus the other areas. I believe the other areas will have stronger years. That's quite bold. A lot of people are very, very pro London. Even saying what I said last year, I, I, I seem like a, I was from Cloud Cuckoo, but I'm glad that the common sense seems to be coming to the market. The North, let's call it that, which is anywhere more than an hour's drive from London. So apologies if you are more than an hour's drive and you don't feel you're in the North, but property wise, let's call that the North. I feel generally in the main areas, so I'm talking about the main city areas or within a very short commute of those areas will do well this year. Not crazy, crazy double digit growth, like some areas of London have experienced, but certainly healthy growth. You know, what's healthy growth? Five to nine percent. You know, the, some of the best cities in the north will perform nearer the nine and the others will be around the five. Some will fall below that, I'm sure. I think generally that's the place where the most value will happen this year. I think London won't fall. I don't think London will fall this year. I think it will be steady growth, but it won't be the strongest performer. Maybe somewhere between 2 to 6%. I know that's quite wide, but basically the point I'm making is not as strong as the North. This hasn't happened yet. So we're in, if, if you listen to this year later and go, oh, you know, that, that was obvious. Remember, I'm, I'm saying this at a time when London has been the strongest performer for quite a few years now. So in a way, it's quite a bold prediction. What interests me is I believe that there's a, a year window and I'm going to start it from the middle of this year, from this summer to summer 2016. And somewhere in there, I do believe that the Chinese property market will go. Now, let me just explain why. It is in a huge, huge bubble, the, the Chinese property market. I've had people try to convince me why it won't collapse. I love it when that happens because I'm even more convinced it will. Because when people try and justify a bubble, you know that it is very, very close to collapsing. China used to, if we go back a, over a decade ago, used to have a massive undersupply of property like the UK does. But unlike the UK, China doesn't really give a crap about planning laws. And they've just built and built and built. And they've gone from a massive undersupply to a huge oversupply of property. In fact, if they stopped building now, they'd have enough property to last them years. That's how much they've overbuilt. That makes me nervous. What also makes me nervous is when the UK property market was building up in its last boom, it was very much bank stimulus. It was cheap lending. You know, it was money flowing into the market and that's what pushed things on. That's happened in China. There's lots of money there. What's doubly worrying is the governments are at it as well. The governments are pushing that market up. So the banks are flooding in with, with stimulus. The governments are stimulating the market. So it's this mega boom that's happened over the, over the last decade. And it's actually now gone to a point where it's getting silly. I do believe it's in what we call the winner's curse. If you go back and listen to the 18-year property cycle, again, we'll link it to it in the show notes. That's a must-listen-to episode, one of our best. Go back and listen to that because you will see that the indicators of a winner's curse, which is the last two years of a market, China is firmly in. When, if China, and I'm, this is probably my biggest, boldest prediction I've, I've ever stated publicly. You know, I might talk privately about these things. So I could look very, very silly on this one. Uh, but if this happens, then what will happen is, first of all, the China property market will go first, followed by within 12 months, the China's general economy. That will therefore have a, a, a kick on effect to Australia. So if it happens in China late this year, it probably won't affect Australia until next year. But why am I talking about this at all? You know, if you invest solely in the UK, why would you give two monkeys? Well, first of all, the Chinese property market isn't that important to the UK property market. But what is important is the Chinese economy. If the Chinese economy follows suit from the property market, and that's what trends tell us, property markets go first, then the economy shortly after within six months. If that does happen, then London will be severely affected London will be affected because there's a lot of Far East money, China, massive proportion of that, 
where people have been piling money into London as a safe haven. Now, if they are cash poor suddenly, are they going to be liquidating those assets? It, at the very least, it will cause nervousness, a possible drop in prices in London, a wobble across the rest of the UK, but I, I, I believe a, a wobble, not a crash. And if that does happen, then London will be more affected than anywhere else because London has been the most stimulated by the money. We will see some big, big claims there. So I'll round up with my predictions this year. I feel confident on the north. I feel bullish. I will be investing there this year. The places I've mentioned are very, very good, I believe, as an investment area. We will do a podcast in a few weeks on the best places to invest in 2015. But I believe the safest and smartest money right now is in the north of England, in the major towns and cities or commuting distance to them. I believe that property prices will be positive for both London and the North this year. And I believe overall, as the the UK as a whole, I think will be around about 5%, give or take a percentage either way, which ties in with the 18-year property cycle when properties rise on average around 5-ish percent each year for the first seven years. So 5%, give or take a percent. I had quite a lot to say there, Rob, but I I wanted to kind of justify some of the, the points and how I got to the numbers I did. Yeah, wow. <laughs> That's, um, they, they are some bold and detailed predictions. And I'm going to struggle to disagree with you on much of that. I think that for me, the, the thing that interests me is London. Because we've talked about the rest of the UK. I completely agree with you. I personally, investing in the Midlands and the North, I think despite what everyone's talking about in terms of house prices being unaffordable and bubbles, all the rest of it, I think in most of the UK, affordability is pretty good. I think prices are solid. And I think the kind of the 4% number across the UK that people have been throwing around, I struggle to disagree with that. I was going to say 4%. I think I'm going to go to 5% if I had to pick out a number for the UK as a whole. But it's London that interests me because that is, as you've said, Rob, the place that's going to be affected by global events, especially if anything does happen in China. But London fascinates me because like, my prediction for this year is that growth in London will be flat. Prices are going to be the same in London a year's time as they are now, which is a fairly dramatic slowdown as far as London's concerned because it's spent years kind of defying the rest of the market and romping ahead. And it seems to me that that's going to happen because London is, as you've said, going to be affected by global events more. There's so much foreign money that could be getting pulled out, depending on global events. And also, there is the new stamp duty changes, which is going to affect expensive properties far more than anywhere else. There also seems to be a bit of a political will. Is there going to be a mansion tax? Is there going to be something else which hits expensive properties? I don't know. But it's London that's going to be affected far more than everywhere else. So there are all these factors that seem to point to the fact that London has gone far enough and it's going to stay where it is or dip down a little bit. Because if prime is affected, which seems like it's, it feels like it should be the case, it feels like there is so much that is going to put a break on prime, that that should have a little ripple effect and affect the rest of London as well. Then again, I was saying exactly the same thing a year ago, and London grew faster than anywhere else last year, and prices went nuts. So... It's really hard to say. And I know that it's like, it's when you start talking about a new paradigm, things will be different this time. That's exactly when the winner's curse kicks in and things are going to take a nosedive. So I'm sticking with it. I'm, I'm still saying that prime is going, going to fall. And that means that the rest of London will have a little bit of wobble and end, end up staying flat because you've got to remember that as well as all the kind of economic factors, London isn't getting any bigger. There's a massive lack of supply and there's a huge amount of demand. So I can't see prices nosediving. It's just not where I'm going to be investing because I think there is better value elsewhere and better growth to be having elsewhere. So I'm sticking to no change in London, but who really knows? I was saying the same thing a year ago. And then in the UK in general, yep, I'm going to say 5% getting there with a late surge because I do see the election kind of the uncertainty around that holding things back. So I think we'll see a little bit of a surge towards the end of the year. In terms of interest rates, just to throw in an extra prediction, I agree, Rob, I do not think that interest rates will go up this year, because while the economy is picking up, the world's economies are so interlinked now that There is so much global uncertainty. It's not just China and Australia. There's so much uncertainty around Europe as well that I think that that's going to keep interest rates where they are. 
So that's our predictions, I think, Rob. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, you may think, blimey neck, I'm going to get in my bunker. But <laughs> don't worry, we have predicted growth, as well as everyone else has. 5% at this part of the market, I'm more than happy with. If I could sign off on 5% growth across my portfolio now, I'm double signing that contract. I'm, I'm rugby tackling to sign it. So I think that's a great year if, if it transpires, and I'm sure it will. So... Wow, another year, Rob. And we've probably been bolder than last year on some of the stuff we, we, we've said. So by the end of this year, there might not be any more podcasts. After China has another booming year and, uh, <laughs> and Australia surges. London kicks on and the North does nothing. Um, <laughs> the stuff we're saying is not just flippant opinions. We are basing it on some logic. So as I say, they are our best educated guesses. But we will see. That's what makes it so interesting. Everybody has an opinion. And we've got an episode coming up in a few weeks, as I mentioned earlier, the best places to invest in 2015. And we've got somebody who's been kind enough to leave us a speak pipe recording. They've got their opinions on the property market as well. And we'll be addressing that and looking at the, the best areas to invest. So we've kind of touched on that today, certainly have, but we're going to go into much more detail. Yeah, indeed. But remember, this is all just a bit of fun, really. It's fun to speculate. We do it because it's interesting and we do it because it's fun and we do it because, yeah, it's important it, just to see how different factors that are going to be happening in the wider world could be affecting us as investors. But I remember that we recorded this similar episode last year and then about a week later we had the Property Hub meetup in January and I was talking to someone who said that he was he was disappointed in us because we kept talking about the long term we were banging on about fundamentals and the long term investments and then we recorded this episode about predictions and he said like why are you talking about this because you know you said that you shouldn't be speculating you shouldn't be gambling and he was absolutely right but it's so it's important to remember that this is all just a bit of fun what prices do in a single year should have no bearing on your investment strategy. You absolutely should be thinking long term. You shouldn't be concerned about whether prices go up 5%, 10%, negative 10%. Ultimately, it shouldn't matter. Obviously, you do need to keep an eye on what's going on in the world around you and have a broad view on what the future holds because you need to be planning your expansion and your contraction accordingly. But the prices of a single year really do not matter. In a couple of years' time, this will all be forgotten, hopefully, unless we're horribly wrong and everyone just keeps reminding of us to annoy us. But in general, it shouldn't affect your investment strategy. Yeah, 100%, Rob. You're, you're right. You know, and the person who pulled you up on that is, is so, so true with what they've said and the long term if you are invested for the long term which is what we do and what a lot of people who listen to this do then you've got no worries about this episode whatsoever in fact you can know you can just wipe out the last half hour of your life and, and think why have i done this however if you're flipping in london this year you're flipping properties in london you may want to be a bit cautious with, with, with what you're doing but generally for most people and i know most people who listen to the podcast do invest for the long term what happens over the next 12 months is, is not too important at all. So kind of a wasted episode. So there you go. That's our next on the line once again. Uh, the show notes for this episode are Property Predictions 2015. And you'll find at the bottom of that page a link over to the Property Hub where you can discuss this episode. And we would love it if you did. We'd love to hear your predictions. Um, tell us where you think we're wrong. Tell us what you think we've missed. We'd really be interested to know. So please do go over there and chip in. And you'll also find all the links for this episode, including the resource of the week. Now, this week, our resource of the week comes from Mark Morris, who is a fantastic contributor in the Property Hub. We met him at our Northern Meetup in Liverpool last year. He's a really great contributor. And one of the things that he's contributed is LandlordTap.com, which is our resource of the week. So this has been a very big picture, macro kind of episode. Let's bring it down to one of the most micro things you could imagine, but which still affects us as property investors. The boring business of telling utility companies about changes of tenancy. There you go, bringing it back down from the Chinese property crash to informing your your utilities about when tenants have changed. So if your properties are managed, not for you, your letting agent should be taking care of this. But if you self-manage, you'll need to tell utilities when there's a change of tenancy to make sure that you're not stuck with any bills. And this site, Landlord Tap, is basically an online portal to tell water companies that the tenancy has changed which basically just saves you a bit of time because it's a real pain at having to either phone up and press one for this and five for that and sit on hold and tell them or have to write a letter 
And it's just a real pain. Whereas so if you've got a lot of properties in your portfolio, as Mark does, you can just go onto the portal, have all your properties listed, and it's really just a couple of clicks to update the property's details, and then they will go away and inform the water company for you. So it's one of those resources which isn't going to change your life, but it is going to change you a bit of time. And as we always talk about efficiency and these little life hacks and stuff, It's pretty important because if you can just save a few minutes here or there on lots of different things, then it opens up lots of time for you to do more interesting things, such as speculate about the global economy. Thank you, Mark, for that one. And and Mark, thank you for your offer of a beer next time I'm up north too. You messaged me recently. And people who contribute on the hub regularly have definitely got a fun place in my heart. But people who do that and then suggest buying me a beer, uh, well, they are just my favourite people. So thank you, Mark. I will take you up on that offer very soon. And talking about some of my other favourite people, Rob... People who leave reviews. Yep, love them. So who have we got this week? We have Beck Corpse. And Beck Corpse says, Excellent, just what I needed. Just wanted to say, thanks for producing such an excellent podcast. It's provided me with a platform to get out there and seriously start my route into property investment. On another note, I would highly recommend Rob's two books as an excellent addition to your property research. One question... Any chance of making the feed stream longer? I can only download the most recent 50 podcasts. Thanks again, Beck Corbs. Well, Beck Corbs, I don't know if that's your real name, but your wish has been granted. All those podcasts are now open. We mentioned it earlier in the episode. You can be aware of the cheesy intro that we had back then. Um, but all the episodes are now available on iTunes. So if you want to go back and listen, please do. They're all there, all the way from number one. Wow, that <laughs> we, you can see how far we've come, or not, um, since then. And yeah, all, all our favourite episodes, the Inflation Podcast, they're, they're all in there. So go back and listen to them. Feel free, they're all there for you now. Yes, they are. But if you do not want to do that, and you've just joined us recently on the podcast, you don't want to trawl back through 100 episodes, I can understand that. So what we've done is we've put together a three-part series for people who want to just get started in property investment. So people have said to me that they've gone back and listened to the first 10 or 20 episodes a lot because they're the ones that cover some of the kind of the fundamental aspects of property investment, which of course we refer back to, but we cover them thoroughly in the earlier episodes. But it's a bit of a pain telling people go back and listen to episode four, then episode 13 and whatever. So what we've done is we've put together a three-part series because called How to Become a Property Investor. And the first part is going to be in next week's episode. So we're going to be going right back to basics. But if you are a more experienced investor, that doesn't mean that you can have three weeks off. No, I hope you'll still join us because I think it's really important to keep going back and looking at the bigger picture as well. It's very easy to get kind of caught up in the nitty gritty of what you do. And I think it's really useful to kind of take a step back sometimes and look at the core principles. So hopefully... Whatever your level of experience, you'll find these episodes to be really beneficial. But especially if you've just joined us more recently and you're thinking, right, 2015 is the year that I really want to crack this. I've been thinking about it for a long time, but I want to invest this year. If that is you, then next week's episode, How to Become a Property Investor, is the one for you. It certainly is. I'm really excited about going back almost to the beginning, condensing them into just a few podcasts. So you can then one, learn yourself, because it's always good, the basics, sometimes it's great to hear them again, because there'll be things like, oh yeah, I used to do that, but I've stopped, that that used to work really well for me. So there's that side for experienced people, but for people who are brand new, well, hopefully you're going to be blown away. But until then, thank you so much for joining us on this episode. We've gone into a lot of detail in this podcast, and I hope you found it enjoyable. But as Rob said, we'd really like to know what you think, what your predictions are, or if you agree or disagree with what we said. So go to the propertyhub.net forward slash property predictions 2015. You can find all the show notes there, everything we've discussed, plus a link into the hub where you can list your own predictions, your own thoughts, your own opinions. We'd love to hear them. We'll be in there looking to see what you've got to say. So please put your predictions in. So for those people who are going to do that now, we'll join you in the hub. But until next week, Rob, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to The Property Podcast. Make sure you join our mailing list at thepropertypodcast.com. And remember, we love five-star reviews. Rob even loves them more than air miles. Air miles.